Hello and welcome once again to the history of comic books. Uh, this is going to be my first video about uh, Marvel Comics property. And uh, I think it's, it has uh, some relative importance, even if it's mostly forgotten by now because it ended up not having the impact that uh, its creators hoped it would, uh, it would have. Um, ar uh, around 2000 and 2001, uh, Marvel was creating new, new lines of, of comics. They, they had launched uh, Marvel Knights a, a few years ago. It was a success and uh, creatively, and uh, they were getting ready to launch the ultimate line of comics, which ended up becoming a very important uh, influence on the way uh, Marvel uh, had uh, Marvel created stories in the in the following years. In fact, it was effectively combining the two uh, because Brian Michael Bendis had started on Daredevil on Marvel Knights, and then he moved to the brand new Ultimate Spider-Man on on, uh, on the Ultimate line, which basically jump-started his whole career. His whole career, and then he took control of the Marvel Universe and spent years on the Avengers. Uh, some would probably say uh, ruining it. Uh, I think he definitely overstated his welcome. And right now, I not, I am no longer a, a fan of what uh, Brian Michael Bendis does nowadays. Um, Marvel used to be something completely different um, a few years ago. The, the fans had a different mindset in the way we approached reading the, the stories. And one of the things that we enjoyed was the, how, uh, how tight the, the continuity was. You could basically start uh, from Fantastic Four number one and anything from that to the present point would make sense, even uh, the way the characters aged. And we had something that was called the, the sliding time scale, which never went past much beyond 12 years. It was usually considered 10. Uh, and in the 80s, it was considered seven years uh, by the way the characters acted uh, from the point of Fantastic Four number one up to now. And, and since there were characters that were around since World War II, now, bet between World War II and the 1960s, uh, there wasn't much of a, a time difference, and some characters who were if either effectively immortal or who had spent years um, frozen in ice or something similar uh, could interact easily with the uh, new characters in the in the present. But as the the, the as the stories uh, evolved into the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, with even with the sliding time scale. The, the past became, uh, became too far away, and um, there was a big hole of time between uh, 1945 and whatever was uh, 10 years ago. And in 2000, that would be, that be, be uh, between 1945 or 54, if you counted the, the 50s heroes, and 1990, there were effectively no superheroes. And some uh, people thought that, that that didn't make sense. And that is why uh, Roger Stern and John Byrne uh, decided to create Marvel, The Lost Generation. So I mean, instead of presenting issue number one, I'm presenting issue number 12. And why is that? Because this series uh, was published backwards. It started with issue number 12 and ended with number one. The funny thing is you can read it from one to 12 and it still makes sense. If you read it from 12 to 1, you are uh, following the POV character uh, across time jumps further and further into the past. Uh, here she is, uh, Dr. Cassandra Locke, a scientist from the 22nd century. And if you follow from 1 to 12, you can see the history of this group of superheroes who existed in that uh, time hole between the end of a uh, timeless heroic era and uh, Fantastic Four number 1. And indeed, they are fallen. Why are they fallen? Well, if they had existed, people would remember them, and they never did. So something bad happened that made people uh, forget that they existed, or uh, simply stop remembering them for any for any reasons. What ended up here is that the story. Uh, 
these characters did not survive beyond uh, this um, this series, except for one of them who appeared sporadically in a John Burns' uh, X Men: the, the Lost Years, which was published around around the, the same time. It was also a continuity implant, supposedly, uh, when, uh, when the X Men didn't have new stories from issues sixty seven to ninety three. And Burn at the time had also done a an attempt at uh, at reviving at, at re, uh, rewriting Spider Man's origin in a modern setting uh, before Ultimate Spider Man. He made Spider Man Chapter One, which was not well received. But beyond the the characters that introduced and uh, the fact that it uh, it was a continuity implant right before a time when we stopped paying attention to continuity. Uh, this was also important because the the style that you find inside these stories is a style that by the year 2000 2001 was becoming old. This is definitely the last uh, fully classic uh, Marvel comic in, ter uh, in terms of the way it was created and, and how it was written, uh, why it was written for, uh, the way it, it was drawn. Stern and Byrne uh, were superstars of the 1980s. Uh, they started working for, uh, together in the CPL gang, a uh, loose affiliation of soon-to-be professionals that were collaborating with the uh, with what was left of Charlton at the time. And then they moved to Marvel. Uh, Stern became an editor and started uh, getting assignments first in the Hulk and then uh, Spider-Man. Uh, Captain America, The Avengers, and, and later we moved to DC to work on Superman. Uh, Byrne was, uh, was one of the biggest superstars. Um, he, started, he started regularly on the Iron Fist and the, the Champions, and then he worked on uh, pretty much every superhero in the Marvel Universe. He had a long run, a long run with Chris Claremont, uh, first on Marvel team up, uh, also uh, on the last issues of Iron Fist, and then uh, on the X-Men. From there, uh, he became uh, he jumped to becoming a writer artist on the Fantastic Four. He also worked on the Avengers. He, he had worked on, with Stern on Captain America. Uh, he had worked on pretty much uh, he had drawn pretty much every Marvel hero uh, with a, if you if you come with guest appearances. And later, he would move to DC, uh, where he uh, of course did the the post crisis Superman reboot, uh, Man of Steel, and uh, in the future, he will also work on his own uh, creator-owned comics, uh, Dark Horse, uh, like Danger Limited and uh, Next Man. At this stage, uh, they were not they were not at the um, at their most uh, famous. Uh, there, there were there are always new superstars coming up, but Stern and Byrne were uh, solid storytellers. That even if no, they were no longer fan favorites, they could deliver a an interesting product, and I I think they they did. So. What we have here with the Marvel The Lost Generation, this is issue number 12, uh, with a very ominous cover where all the heroes died. Issue number 11, a uh, more heroic cover, uh, featuring the members of the first line, the superhero team that uh, existed in this time period. Uh, they they become involved with, with events like uh, the, um, the Roswell incident in 1947, uh, the the Kennedy shooting, um, also also on the um, the the first uh, lunar mission uh, with a uh, with the Apollo, astro Apollo astronauts, and all, with other events that uh, were important for, in the uh, the social change of the United States between the 1960s and 80s. There are also several uh, cameos by well-known superheroes. We'll get to them in a in a bit. Wait, I'm not going to going backwards. Sorry. Eleven. Yes, number ten. This is the Eternal Brain. Is is one of the is the only timely hero. That was uh, recycled to appear in the, the Lost Generation. Although there are a few characters from the Atlas uh, time that appear here. Okay. 
the the first one uh, in the late seventies, early eighties. One thing is that the, the corner box character, Mako, hardly appears in this series, but she has a, a very interesting design. Oh. This is issue number eight, a bit of horror. They took advantage of the fact that in the 1950s, uh, Marvel published a lot of uh, first non-code horror stories, and then uh, in the late 50s, um, the monster stories that were so famous uh, that made Jack Kirby uh, the, the main storyteller at Marvel just before uh, Marvel launched the Fantastic Four number one. So here's one of those cameos, supposedly the invaders. This is them on, on the Apollo mission. Kind of, uh, the design here kind of reminds you of uh, John Jameson, Man Wolf. And th there are uh, a lot of characters that you look at them and I I I've seen this before. There's an, an Iron Man character and a, a Hawkeye character, a Batman character. Issue number five, I think from the hammer, it's quite obvious uh, who appears here. Issue number four, fighting monsters. And this this is the, the kind of reminds me of the um, of the fight be between uh, that was choreographed by by Bird on Alpha Flight uh, between uh, Snowbird and one of the great beasts. Of course, uh, then after it had started, uh, Bird had all those uh, white pages where you should be able to see anything because it was supposed to be snow. Another uh, character from the 50s, the, the Yellow Claw, less yellow than usual. Uh, Fossil Namor here. Hardly looks like him, but uh, you can see that, that it's him in the, on the inside. The Monster Hunters, who appear in here in issue number two, uh, they were created by Roger Stern, uh, recycling a bunch of old characters from the from the 50s and 60s. And they had appeared in an anthology title called Marvel Universe that was unfortunately canceled after only seven issues. I thought it was quite interesting because it went further away from the Marvel Universe than was normal. Uh, there were some market conditions that uh, ultimately didn't help it, even with uh, Stern on board. And number one, which was actually the last issue. And these are basically the, the majority of superheroes who are appearing in the stories. But if you read from from 1 to 12, you, you see the, the teen's history. And, and I, I think it's more interesting to read it like that. Cassandra Locke is the POV character, but she, she doesn't do much from a story to, to story. Um, oh, there's a friend of mine from uh, from Minds.com. Hello, this identity. Yeah, the, this uh, this stream is about uh, comic books, so it's probably not your uh, favorite uh, thing. But if you want to stick around, you can uh, you can have some fun and uh, and see what I, I like doing for a um, uh, for fun. Uh, I collect. I've been collecting comic books for over thirty years now. Um, so, in issue number one. It starts with Kenya, as you can see here. Uh, Hike Harris. <laughs> uh, Hike Harris is the, the civilian identity of uh, Icarus from uh, the Jack Kirby's Eternals. And the Eternals are a group of immortal characters created by Jack Kirby in the 1970s, uh, who became uh, a permanent fixture, fixture in the Marvel Universe since then. Although not every series uh, has become a a success. The the characters are appreciated by a, by a several groups of several writers, and a, a few of their members have uh, joined the the ranks of the superhero teams like the Avengers, including uh, Cersei, who was a member of the the Avengers during the 1990s. You can also see here the the 1950s Captain America and Bucky. Uh, they had gone on ice. Uh, Shortly before this, uh, they took the super soldier serum, but uh, instead of becoming heroic like Steve Rogers, uh, they they went crazy and started uh, basically 
punching their way through what they perceive to be American infiltrators. Another thing that, that, you can, that appears in this issue is uh, a scroll. The, the scrolls uh, have long, although they appeared early on in a Fantastic Four uh, number two, um, and where it appeared that it was the, the first time that they had been to Earth, there have, since then there have been several stories uh, where they uh, appeared before the beginning of the, of the Marvel Universe. Uh, and they, they had a hand in uh, creating uh, quite, a, quite a few characters, uh, by, either by leaving technology behind or by getting directly involved. So it makes sense that the, the scrolls appear here. And it was a couple of years before we got tired of scrolls with Civil War. But, but they, it makes sense that they're the, the main villains. Uh, since they, uh, they, they're, shape cha they're shape changers, they have the ability to pass as humans and uh, to become uh, characters in other stories uh, without us knowing that they were scrolls. This marks the beginning of the Yankee Clipper. The, the Clipper hardly appears in the, in the story, but he's uh, the main motivator. He's supposedly the first uh, of the first line, but he disappeared in a, in a mission uh, early on in their, in their career, and nobody knows what happened to him. And it turns out that his kid brother, who was a sad kid, Kid Justice, uh, then became the slightly violent Mr. Justice. The, the perceived to be field field leader uh, of the, the perceived to be field leader of the of the first line. Here's another friend. Hello, Pedro. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The. Um, it was not. It was supposed to be launched in Marvel Universe, but there were there were also a few stories that were supposed to be launched in Marvel Universe. Uh, Roger Stern told us about uh, his plans. I'll, pro I'll probably pick it up in a in a couple of weeks. Uh, th there were two story arcs from issues one one to four and uh, five to seven. The first with the invaders and the second with the monster hunters, who are uh, exactly here. The what they did with the. What Roger Stern did with the Monster Hunters was uh, pick up uh, Ulysses Bloodstone, who appears in a few stories in the 1970s, mainly uh, in uh, the Hulk's Black and White magazine. Uh, also, also members were uh, Namora, uh, Namora's cousin. And here in the back, you can see uh, Dr. Druid, and this is Special Agent uh, Jake Curtis, who is actually one of the Eternals, Macquarie, and uh, created specifically for the this property, uh, Zawadi. Stern seems to imply here that she's a member of the Wakanda royal family. So it's quite a shame that she never, she's never used by anyone else. And she was uh, she wasn't used even by Christopher Priest, who was much more uh, continuity inclined than anybody who came after him. Who just seem to want to write what the Black Panther for political purposes. There's, there's always some action going on in the 22nd century from when Cassandra Locke comes. Turns out that she's trying to find uh, evidence that the, the scrolls who are apparently allies uh, here, that they have actually been messing with the uh, with humanity for uh, centuries, and this is just another attempt at an invasion. Here, the Monster Hunters were supposed to be active during the 50s and 60s, uh, although quite covert. Uh, and supposedly, they were also the um, superhero. They were also the many of the heroes that appeared in the monster stories in the 1960s. So uh, if they were supposed to be active in the 50s and 60s, they would have run in uh, with the front line, uh, as happens here when 
the black fox in his uh, first uniform uh, meets Zawadi. Several characters in action. The special agent Scott, the, the man who is actually a scroll that uh, is helping the team, although at the time he still hasn't completely turned. Uh, it, there, there's a lot of evolution with the uh, with the, the scroll, who is uh, will later be known as Effigy, and use an incident to gain uh, shape-changing powers um, and become the hero known as Effigy. He is also he is also a special agent from the NSA, uh, Scott, and he will become an, an important politician. The, 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 much of the series is about how he evolves in, uh, the, in the way he perceives himself, himself to be either a, a scroll or, um, or a human, uh, and he became quite uh, interested in the progression of the social and scientific progression of the United States uh, throughout this period from the 1950s to the 80s. There's a, a thing that I that I didn't like about the the Yankee Clippers uh, costume. Because if this was supposed to be the 1950s and six and early 60s, the, the, this design looks a lot uh, like uh, like what we saw in the 90s. Um, the non the air hope the open hair in the in the face mask and the the bare arms they were not normal uh, designs for. And even the, the belt is with the uh, pouches, not what we had in the in the nineteen in the more like we had in the nineteen nineties and not in the fifties and sixties. There are a few uh, villains that were also created for these series. A couple of them will actually uh, become uh, become heroes, in, and they will join the, the first line. Uh, there, there was room for a character improvement, even if we didn't pay, if we didn't follow them uh, on their everyday lives, like we did with the, the rest of the with with, the, with normal superheroes. This is the incident that allows uh, Galmax the scroll to become effigy. An important member also joins here. So uh, she gets called Florence Nightingale, Nightingale as a as a joke, but that will, that will become her code name. Nightingale. Uh, she's basically the the group's healer, and she has a sort of purpose to to being there, since she says she has uh, many lives, although she's not leaving them. Issue number three: the the Yellow Claw and Namor. Namor was the the last of the timely heroes that to be cancelled in the nineteen fifties revival. Uh, because they they were looking to to do a TV series with him, uh, but the the project fell through. Uh, I doubt that they'd be able to create a, a convincing uh, portrayal on TV of underwater action, um, and if, if we would have to wait until the the late seventies for uh, the Man from Atlantis, which was actually based on Namor, but uh, they didn't use any of the any of the names. Uh, for uh, the character that was uh, that was portrayed by by Patrick Duffy, uh, better known from Dallas. Here's a team in action. One one of the things that we had in the from the 60s to the to the 90s was the uh, a, a lot of comics started with action scenes, but it was the characters uh, practicing uh, in the, in their headquarters. It was a good way to get acquainted with their superpowers, since it was understood at the time that any comic could be uh, anybody's first. This character here is the, the, the hipster. He will then become Captain Hip. 
he will he, he'll never joins the first line although he's uh, present as a sad line character he has superpowers but he doesn't know where he got them and he takes advantage of the of social movements at the time uh, first the the hipster movement of the 1950s and then the hippie movement of the 1960s and a lot of the, his philosophy uh, appears in the way he fights crime first chronological appearance of pixie without the, the rest of the team knowing she's a, she's actually a, an eternal and she's the the only character from the this series that appears uh, somewhere else she had appearances in a um, expand the hidden years by by John Byrne probably she was probably created by Byrne since they're credited as um, co-plotters so and Byrne is used to working with the writers when, whenever uh, he's not writing himself she's looking for a team to join but it takes a while finally the, the yellow claw and uh, his assistant in, in the 1950s uh, Fritz von Boltzmann. The, the both of them appeared in the the Yellow Claw series in the mid fifties. Uh, the first issue was at heart by Joe Manili, but issues two to four were completely done by Jack Kirby uh, with uh, with uh, his wife uh, Roz, uh, with Roz assisting him on on, uh, on the art. And but and he was one of those cases where. The antagonist was the the main draw of the series since the the main hero was uh, FBA agent Jimmy Wu, who who does not appear here. Uh, although we will see some uh, Shield agents in the future. Also, at the, at the time, the the Submariner was uh, amnesiac until Fantastic Four number four when he was uh, brought back. They didn't know what happened to him. Uh, Namor had already left the Monster Hunters here. Uh, and she's speaking to her her cousin, the, the usually treacherous Byra, and another of uh, Namor's uh, villains from the 60s, uh, Warlord Krang. You're working on the creating a, a mutated uh, being called uh, Mako. She will appear occasionally, but not, not much. And she has a, a great design. Also here uh, is the, the Black Fox, now in, a, in more of a Batman look, Creature of the Night. He, be, he continually gets angrier as the, as the series progresses. And he's usually treated as the, the most politically conservative of the, the, of the first line. Issue number four tells us the Valmax's origins, how he, how he arrived on Earth at the 1947 Roswell incident. Lisa come back, comes back here, finding a, a new friend. He will appear later in the series. We'll get back to him in a some time. We are the Oswald. A few monstrous characters uh, running around. A couple of them turn out to be scrolls. Actually, not actually not quite. Uh, the, um, this one is Chimera, and he will evolve into something uh, else uh, by the end of the series. Here, Chimera kills uh, Kid Justice's girl girlfriend. And there's the incident that makes the as the, the Yankee Clipper dis disappear. Uh, the, the, the first line is actually quite worried about what's going to happen. Uh, because how are they going to explain that the, their, main, uh, their main member, the, the Yankee Clipper, disappeared? But since that happened in the same day as uh, John F. Kennedy's shooting, uh, nobody paid, nobody ended up paying attention, and 
that's one of that's one of the reasons that we can understand the first line to become forgotten since there were other things more important that would, that would ca uh, catch normal people's attention. So let's get some superheroes uh, from the future here. Odin, who is actually seems to have both eyes here. Thor is not the only appearance here. Uh, Venus also appears. Venus appeared in a series of um, in a series that lasted for nineteen issues uh, between the late forties and the early fifties. Uh, the first half was a, sort of a, a mixture of romance comic and uh, action adventure and more so than other romance comics since they also had a a permanent character which was not usual in the in atlas's romance comics line and uh, halfway through the through the run bill Everett took over the title and it morphed into what was pop popular at the time which was pre-code horror stories uh, venus is actually supposed to be the real venus who has appeared occasionally uh, whenever Hercules is involved. And people thought that it was the real Venus that was working with the 1950s Avengers. Uh, here's a, another visitor. Hello, Samuel Trejo. How's it, how's it going on? Also, other appearances by uh, Captain Hip, uh, who we saw in the previous issue as the hipster, and, uh, Sunsh and his wife, uh, Sunshine. Also, uh, Pixie showing off her powers and having a hard time understanding why they don't work on the mighty Thor. Thor is actually quite angry uh, with having been dispatched to Earth by Odin. Uh, this was a couple of years be before the, the Thor series, so he, he hadn't been turning to Donald Blake yet. Also appearances by other heroes. Here is Mercury, uh, is Mercury, is the identity of Major Mercury. Uh, Mercury is also understood to be a couple of uh, timely heroes uh, from the 40s, uh, namely the, the Hurricane. There's one for a uh, Frankenstein uh, homage. This is not the, the real Frankenstein's monster. It is called Frank throughout the, the story. Uh, by the time that the, the story is over, uh, Thor takes off. He really does not enjoy being among mortals here, and he, he says that he has no interest in joining uh, a team of superheroes, even though he is he, invited. As he says here, with the evil vanquished, with the evil vanquished, I have no reason to stay, and even less interest in thy motley crew. He, he will actually have a. Uh, a much better time as a member of the Avengers, a team that would defend him and he would defend them to, to the death. But here he simply is not, not into it. Let's go back to issue number six. And the scrolls are trying to interfere in the, the Apollo mission. Using a, a few of the super villains. Luckily for them, they can't get along, and they end up. A couple of them end up uh, switching sides. If not here, then a, a couple of a couple of issues later, or earlier, uh, if you if you, st if you started reading and from from issue number twelve, uh, as it was the 
the normal if you uh, if you had bought the the book at the time. Effigy gives them scroll technology, and uh, he has to explain to the heroes why he simply didn't give the this technology to to NASA. Uh, instead, he's letting uh, NASA do everything on their own. Uh, he's even telling the other team, the rest of the team, not to upstage the the astronauts. Uh, since uh, one of them, Blackjack, who was a super villain in another of the stories, is saying, hey, let's go say hi to the astronauts. Uh, we also saw the, this one a couple of issues earlier. Is Oxbow is a Native American, super strong, and uh, good with the bow and arrow. Kind of a cross between Hawkeye and uh, Thunderbird from the X-Men. And here is when uh, Effigy finally decides that he wants to stay on Earth, he wants to be human, he no longer wishes to go back to, to the Scroll Empire. He also has to tell the, the rest of the team exactly what the Scrolls are. It becomes sort of their secret. The, the rest of the Marvel Universe is not uh, aware of the existence of uh, aliens. So so the, the scrolls stay hidden until they are finally revealed in Fantastic Four number two. Also, a supposed cameo by the invaders. Turns out that it's not them, but there's a few other members in the team uh, around around this time. Uh, the Black Fox's ex-girlfriend uh, and uh, a sort of knight and squire. Called the uh, Serpent Bar and Vulcan. They appear uh, the, this one with the armor and uh, the sidekick. A new uh, villain, Nocturne. Turns out he's a vampire, but they don't know. They don't know yet. He will appear on a can uh, in an issue with other uh, cameos from uh, other Marvel superheroes. This start uh, this issue has a Cassandra Locke's parallel story uh, going uh, down here in the pages, and turns out she was uh, sent forward, and she wa was witnessing the the first time that uh, the Fantastic Four. Uh, met the, the Inhumans. Also, uh, advertising for uh, the Ultimate Line of Comics, uh, which was uh, in its infancy at the time, and which completely ruined the, the classic Marvel Universe uh, that is portrayed here uh, in this story. This one uh, also make, has the, the cameo that will be appears in the other the other comic with the Namor and the and the yellow claw. So moving forward, this is the issue. Of, it's revealed that that Nocturne is a vampire. Uh, Black Fox is a uh, it's active, even if the, the first line has been out of commission because of the Watergate scandal. They weren't involved in it, but uh, Nixon was already acting erratic. Uh, so here's an, uh, another interesting Kenya by uh, Dr. Strange. Here's one thing from the, the original uh, stories in Strange Tales. Uh, it appears that um, in the first two stories, which were published before uh, his origin story, uh, actually make that three, the origin story was in 115, and he appeared in 110, 111, 114. Uh, Doctor Strange was portrayed as uh, already being known. Uh, he's, he's recruited uh, into, into work, pressed into work in the first story. And he seems to already have been active for a, a number of years since uh, in his first en enemy, uh, Nightmare, uh, Nightmare 
uh, makes it clear clear that uh, they they are already acquainted with each other and uh, even calls him his old enemy. So if since he is apparently immortal on uh, on the basis that is the future sorcerer supreme here, it would make sense that he would appear in the story. Although it kind of looks like more the way he was portrayed in the in his first appearances in Strange Tales, uh, instead of the the more movie star looks that he had uh, after the origin story. Of course, Doctor Strange was modeled after uh, Vincent Price. Also, it appears by Diablo, future uh, enemy of the Fantastic Four. It is still still in prison here. Uh, what happens in the Fantastic Four is that uh, they frame. Is now it's revealed that Nocturne is a vampire. They have a hard time killing him, so they don't. The heroes look more, more modern here, especially since we have uh, Professor Carmody, the Eternal Brain, appearing. Uh, the Eternal Brain appeared in um, one issue in the 1960s. Or in the in the 1940s uh, in uh, Red Raven comics number one, I think that was it. He only appeared once, so it probably it was probably Red Raven, and he is reduced to his brain and walking around in a mechanical apparatus. He is also pressed into service by Effigy into joining uh, the more secretive first line. A few more members that have never appeared, including the uh, Flat Iron, one of the Iron Man characters that that appears here, and Positron, only appears in this story. And also one of two appearances by Nick Fury, uh, still with a functional, at the time he, he was already, he, he would have already lost uh, his, uh, his left eye, but he, he has a, a prosthetic, an electronic prosthetic that, he, that he's been using, uh, that's something that he, that he enjoys. Black Jack gets killed here. It, the, the, the good thing about this series is that since all of these heroes are new and they ended up not, not appearing elsewhere, it's actually normal uh, for a lot of uh, brand new heroes from the 80s and 90s to then be forgotten by future writers because they didn't make that much of an impression as the more long running ones. So, in the end, it allows uh, Burning and Stern to take more liberties uh, with them and kill them, and uh, kill them if the story calls for it. Fury's back here. He wants to. Figure, uh, he was told. He was still at the CIA. He was told to figure out uh, what's the deal with Professor Carmody. Effigy reveals to Fury that his secretary Scott, former former uh, special agent Scott, and since we've had Eternals, uh, it's about time for the Deviants to make their appearance, including Warlord Crow. Um, he, he, he was portrayed in, in his first appearance in the Eternals. Uh, it, it was said that um, they didn't uh, the Deviants had been out of commission uh, for uh, for a while. Since Tina says that she had, she hadn't seen Crow in a, a couple of millennium, but um, in the Marvel Universe arc, um, Macri uh, reveals that the the forty stories with the hurricane, the uh, the Satan that appeared there was uh, actually Crow, the the only deviant that is actually that has eternal genes.
Captain Hip and Sunshine appear here. Uh, their daughter turns out to have uh, superpowers. Ruth McRae here. Uh, she jumps out of a window and uh, her dad go, goes after her. There's a couple of inserts here that don't do anything for the story. And Professor Carmody uh, joins up with a with another Iron Man type character, Walkabout, who is actually a semi-sentient robot. Uh, the, this thing kind of reminds us of um, both Arnim Zola and the uh, Krang from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, since the the brain is in the is in his stomach. Uh, here, um, Carmody had uh, evolved from a brain to a humuncle as he was trying to get a a physical body again. He tries to go after Crow, although they, they don't meet, so it's it's okay with continuity that the majority of the Eternals are not aware that uh, Warlord Crow is active at the time. Number 11, the most heroic cover of all. Also a nod to, uh, you can see that walkabout as going to more of Iron Man, uh, Iron Man's armor, more so than uh, the the other Iron Man type character, uh, Flat Iron. Nocturne is still alive here, he evolved into a sort of uh, computer virus. There's also another uh, attempt at a scroll invasion, which leads to a cameo by Ben Grimm here and Reed Richards. They were superimposed into a one of those science fiction stories from the early 60s. The Specifically, I think it was, it's not here, it's, it's in another of the, the comics. But I think it was Amazing uh, Adult Fantasy number seven. So they, they were superimposed on the characters from, uh, from that story uh, about uh, an alien invader that unmasks himself because he's able to understand the, the alien language uh, from the device he's trying to use to to convince other people that there's an alien invasion coming. Uh, nobody, everybody else hears it as gibberish, and they're saying that uh, this guy is pulling a prank on them, and it's only, it's only the, the scientist character that is able to recognize why uh, this character is able to understand. So finally, issue number 12. Different, cover, different paper stock here, uh, paper. And finally, uh, an appearance by the Watcher. Cassandra Locke finally arrives at the end of the, the first line. So this is one of those serendipitous moments where the, the watcher appears and something ominous is uh, about to happen. And this is a, this is a major push by, by the scrolls and a, a lot of heroes get, get killed. It's, Every time you turn the page, it's actually quite a bloodbath. And there are only a few of the heroes that managed to survive. Even the Black Fox appears to die here, but uh, as, it was, as it was seen on issue number one, he didn't. Pixie survived as well, since she's an eternal. Uh, and uh, Yeti, who was an inhuman, uh, they don't explain how he survives. A bunch of heroes get killed here. And so this. Uh,
and so does Effigy. And it's here that they found out, find out that he's a scroll. Uh, although he had told uh, the, the team about the, the scrolls, uh, he didn't, uh, Effigy didn't tell the, the first line that he was a scroll himself. So in the end, everyone dies and just in time for the heroic era to, to begin. So another cameo by Doctor Strange, who was already active. And the, the Watcher being all somber as uh, his usual self. So that's it. Um, going from issue 1 to 12, as I said, you can read this both from 1 to 12, and it's the story of the, of the first line, or from 12 to 1. And it's uh, the from, point, from Cassandra Locke's point of view of what she's trying to, to achieve. As I said, this was the, um, the whole point was that this was the last classic story in, by, by Marvel. So Roger Stern writes, John Byrne draws. Um, we also have uh, manual uh, lettering by uh, Jack Morelli. And uh, Glenn uh, Glen is, uh, Glen is Oliver does, does the, the, the color. So, Everything screams classic uh, about the, this series. Uh, Stern and Byrne did not do much for uh, for Marvel after this. Uh, in, in fact, uh, Stern practically disappeared. Uh, he hasn't had an ongoing assignment for over 10 years. And Byrne is trying to do his own projects at IDW, uh, including a pseudo James Bond, and uh, there was the uh, FX series and uh, an attempt at trying to recycle the, the, the next man. But that's what he's doing. And uh, the new generation, uh, they don't know who Roger Stern and John Byrne are. Uh, and Sam, Sam, yeah, Byrne was a writer. Uh, uh, Byrne started as an artist at, the, at Charlton. Um, but uh, in, in, the, in his first, his first assignments for Marvel was uh, were uh, in the art department. Um, he did Iron Fist. He did a, a Dracula one shot, and he only started co-writing with Chris Claremont on the X Men, and that was before he started uh, writing uh, full time on the Fantastic Four. Uh, but he he is he, okay doing uh, co-writing uh, with uh, other uh, other writers if he's if he's doing the art. And this was also the, the last time that Marvel tried to do uh, something about continuity. Um, in 1996, uh, Mark Grunwald, one of the Marvel's top editors, uh, uh, died uh, that early. And he, he was the main keeper of continuity at Marvel. And without him there, and also with uh, Marvel's uh, bankruptcy and a lot of the, of the old hands, uh, leaving the editorial department. As, as soon as new names came on board, including Joe Quesada, and they stopped paying attention to continuity. This was the last time that they did something specifically to address continuity. It's an in, in, a continuity implant that works, and uh, there aren't any more. So this story was, came out over 15 years ago. Uh, it's 12 issues. Uh, I hope it was never collected uh, as a trade paperback, so he, uh, if you can find it, I hope it's in the 50 cent bin. Uh, uh, that way you can get a 200 pages, uh, over 200 pages of story for, uh, for $6. And if you're an old school uh, Marvel fan and you miss the, the old school style, and you want to read something that you, that you've never read before because this, this was far from a, a sales success. Uh, a lot of people were interested in the story, but uh, it was not for a continuity implants. Don't sell to the, the majority of, uh, of fans. Uh, only so it was only a select that were really interested in it. So it, it's probable that the majority of people that could be interested in this series didn't read it. So uh, I recommend it. It's a, a good, fun story with a. It's a tragic, a tragic tale of uh, of heroism, and it functions well. 
with what uh, was the, the Marvel Universe until 15 years ago. So uh, to everybody who was in the chat, thank you very much for uh, staying with me. I, I wanted to see if I, if I could do a, a short video, but I ended up going almost an hour again. And uh, I'm going to have to figure out a different way to not do so, such long videos. Uh, I still don't have any plans for uh, for next week. Uh, maybe you'd like to. Maybe you'd like me to review uh, something different. So I'll think about what, what I'll do next week. And until then, uh, keep reading old comics. Bye bye.